Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light was released in 1990 as the first entry in the Fire Emblem series. In this game, he played as Marth, and his personality could basically be summed up like this. There's nothing objectively wrong with Marth's personality, especially considering when his first game came out. My problem is that they decided to remake this same character for 30 more years. I know it's a bit cliche to complain about Fire Emblem characters all being very similar, but it really is true for most of the protagonists. The Fire Emblem wiki states that Marth is an upstanding, thoughtful, and idealistic young man. While he would prefer to avoid bloodshed, he maintains a strong resolve to see peace return to Elite. What? Oh, this is Roy's wiki. Uh, here's Marth. Um, Marth is a merciful soul who detests violence. He is a kind-hearted and careful person, and his peaceful demeanor contrasts with her brother Ephraim. Ah, shit. Three Houses looked like it was actually going to be the first game in a while to break from this trend. Girl saying sinister things over a trailer? Seems interesting. A walking shitpost? Awesome. However, I really didn't care for the third house leader, Ellawood. Based off the trailers and his appearance in the prologue, I really thought Dimitri was just going to be another addition to a long line of the good boy, noble hero archetype. But even before the game was released, there was a lot of people who were really excited to play Dimitri's route. And most of them cited this one trailer as their reasoning. Kill every last one of them! I thought this was very fake at the time. The advertising implied that Dimitri would develop from a good person into a bloodthirsty monster over the course of the story, and considering how difficult that type of story is to write normally, let alone in a video game, I am the most powerful hedgehog in the world! I felt very confident at the time that this route was going to flop. Fire Emblem's favorite plot device is mind control, and I was very convinced this cutscene was going to be part of a one-chapter Possessed Dimitri plotline. At the time, the newest Fire Emblem game I had played was Fates, and in that game, there's a guy whose personality was liking pickles. Our love is stronger than the world's most pungent pickle. Fire Emblem clearly isn't capable of... Sever their limbs and crush their wicked skulls! I will continue to use you and your friends until the flesh falls <laughs> from your bones. The dead must have their tribute. Is this some kind of twisted joke? Okay, I was wrong. There's a reason why I put quotation marks around the word fix for this video, but not for any of the others. Crimson Flower I liked for the most part, except that it ended early and certain plot lines were ridiculous. Verdant Wind had a story that just had nothing to do with its protagonist, and Silver Snow forgot to have a protagonist. While Azure Moon did make some mistakes, I feel the mistakes made were pretty minor compared to the other routes. And Azure Moon also does a lot of remarkable things that I feel people often overlook. And don't worry, if there are any Edelgard stands out there who I pissed off in my last video, I will be complaining about this route too, just let me get through this next section. Uh, first up, Dimitri is best character. While playing through Azure Moon for the first time, I found myself wanting to play Dimitri's Fallen Ark forever, and yet deep down I also wanted it to end as soon as possible. Dimitri makes so many self-destructive decisions on this route that at some point it ends up draining on the player's soul. He's set up so well as the good boy archetype in the pre-time skip, that when we see him act like a supervillain time and time again, eventually we just start to feel sorry for him instead of hate him. That isn't to say that Dimitri's Fallen Ark isn't entertaining, however. In fact, while this game's writing seems to be all over the place, these five chapters are what I believe to be the pinnacle of Three Houses' writing. Chris Hackney's monologues in particular are endlessly captivating, and his rats monologue was one of the most quoted things in my apartment. Okay! Let's say you have a rat, and it's stuck in the glue trap. You're going to want to bash that rat to put it out of its misery as soon as you can. Got that one with one clean swipe. Here's a modern day version of a rat stick. Much more effective. Out of my way! That got that rat good. Those rats are mating. We got to stop them before there's more rats. Dimitri also has some of the most consistently entertaining support conversations. His supports with Marianne and Felix get a lot of attention, and rightfully so, but I really do recommend seeing his A support with Gilbert if you've never seen it before. Despite how much you may or may not like Gilbert, this support still sticks as one of the best in the franchise to me. Anyways, Edelgard is the best antagonist Fire Emblem has ever had. Azure Moon might be the first time a story has made me feel bad for both the protagonist and the antagonist. I think playing Crimson Flower first might help that feeling, 
but Azure Moon does such an excellent job at setting up Edelgard that it really isn't necessary. On this route alone, we learn about Edelgard's childhood, the mysterious past of her mother, and we even learn about whatever the hell this thing is. But not only does the player not want to kill Edelgard, Dimitri doesn't want to do it either. Dimitri does everything he can to offer Edelgard a peaceful end to the war, and after seeing how obsessing over her death had changed Dimitri, I really thought Dimitri would find a way to spare her. This ending was really unexpected the first time I saw it, and it still surprises me to this day that the writers would side with an ending so depressing. Also, this demonic beast transformation was such a curveball. The only spoiler I heard about this final boss was the word LANK, and this is not what I expected, especially after having played as Edelgard in Crimson Flower and Silver Snow. Also, the 32 range was a really unique boss mechanic, and honestly, I'm surprised they didn't add it to Heroes. <laughs> Next up, Felix is always right about everything. Man, it sure is a bummer that Fish Girl got kidnapped. I wonder who the Death Knight is. It's Yuritsa. Oh yeah. Well, I guess it was kind of obvious that edgy piece of shit was behind it. But surely your random guessing will never turn out true again. Wow, Dimitri and Dadu are such great guys. I bet both of them will have bright- Dimitri is just a violent bore. When he finally snaps, Dadu and the better part of our country are going to support his suicidal campaign to avenge the loss of his family. Dude, will you chill the fuck out? I know some people dislike how Felix constantly argues with Dimitri, but still continues to serve in his army, but personally I like Felix's role just how it is. Most of the Blue Lions serve Dimitri out of loyalty and rarely speak up about any of his more homicidal decisions. We must kill every last one of them. I feel that Felix is a much needed voice of reason during the early time skip, and he really is the only character I can relate to in these scenes. And finally we have stuff that isn't significant enough for its own section. Despite the shit thrown in his direction, Rodriguez is the most developed side character in the entire game, and he is a great motivation for Felix. To my knowledge, this is the only route where the Lord's Hero Relics have plot relevance. In other routes, the weapons magically show up in your inventory, but both Fail not. and Aritvar. are plot relevant in Azure Moon. I like the fact that the game never confirms whether Dimitri is actually seeing ghosts or not. Many people assume it's part of a mental illness, but then again, Byleth may or may not have seen a ghost in Silver Snow, and I think it makes for great discussion. I know a lot of people would have liked to learn more about Patricia's involvement with the tragedy of Dusker, but I personally liked how the game left it. Cornelia really only brings up Patricia's betrayal to get a rise out of Dimitri, but Dimitri recognizes this and chooses to ignore Cornelia to avoid going into another psychotic rampage. Try as that woman might to spout nonsense to her very last, nothing could change the fact that she was an enemy of the kingdom. Maybe it would have been nice for other characters or routes to go over Patricia's story, but again, I think it works well as it is. I love how Dimitri unwittingly motivates Edelgard to conquer Fodlin. Dimitri gives her a dagger and tells her to cut her own path, and then is surprised that her path involves ruining his life and stabbing him. If you take Dimitri to the Goddess Tower, he states that the Goddess would never so much as offer her hands to people in peril, and even if she did, that they'd lack the means to reach out and grasp it. Then, five years later, you meet Dimitri again in the Goddess Tower, and you, the reincarnation of the Goddess, reach your hand out to Dimitri and he doesn't even realize you're there. Later you reach out your hand to Dimitri, and this time he does grasp your hand, which miraculously brings him out of his murder mode. Then in the last chapter, Dimitri tries to spare Edelgard by reaching out his hand, only for her not to accept the offer and she dies. And then he holds Byla's hand again as they walk away, and they hold hands again in the S support. Okay, I'm done now. Let, let's get into bad parts. This is very low-hanging fruit, but Rodrigue's death is embarrassing. It's arguably the most important scene in the entire route, but it's reduced to being one of those still image cutscenes. Flesh attacking Dimitri is actually in far worse shape, being reduced to an enemy spawning animation. Dimitri takes less than a day to snap out of his fallen state. This always felt rushed to me, and it really should have taken longer for this change to have taken place. Dudu will permanently leave your army if you don't play as Paralog, and I have no idea why this is a real game mechanic. The conflict between Rhea and the Agarthans is completely ignored on this route, and while it does leave more room for Dimitri's character development, it feels like the route is incomplete without dealing with the missile-launching mole people problem. Speaking of Dimitri stealing the plot, the non-Felix Blue Lions have almost nothing to do in cutscenes and feel unimportant in their own route. 
Gilbert in particular is in great need of character development, as currently most of the fanbase views him as just a shit dad to Annette. Most characters from other houses have poor, non bioleth reasons for choosing to join serial killer Dimitri. I don't really see an easy fix for this, as it's really hard to write in a reason for the students to betray their country for this guy. I will continue to use you and your friends until the flesh falls from your bones. Byleth tagging along in Dimitri's schemes is particularly bizarre, but I blame the decision to use a silent protagonist in general more than I blame Azure Moon's use of Byleth. And while it is more unique than most of the other routes, Azure Moon still has many chapters directly stolen from the other routes. And that's it really, other than the fact that I don't really like any of these characters. Anyways, uh, this is a new Azure Moon. The biggest problem with the early time skip is how many levels are just directly ripped from other routes. The thing is, a lot of routes have this problem, and I already gave the other routes new levels in previous videos. The gameplay already matches the plot and Dimitri's character well anyway, so most changes I would make to individual maps would be pretty minor. The biggest change would be in Chapter 14, where Byleth's army comes up with a scheme and then kills a retreating army. Azure Moon would give the scheme part of the level to Claude, while Dimitri keeps the killing survivors part. Other chapters would have more minor changes like Byleth's army starting in different locations depending on the route. Claude getting involved in the Battle of the Eagle and Lion is really ridiculous, and I addressed that in my Vernon Wind video. What's more of a problem in this chapter is Rodrigue's death, and I think it goes without saying that it needed a full 2D cutscene treatment. If that weren't a possibility, the 3D cutscenes like the one shown here would have been great to see. Also, they could have just written Rodrigue's death so that Byleth isn't standing right next to him when it happens. Byleth, you have Divine Pulse! You could have stopped this, you asshole! What the fuck? The cutscene for Dimitri announcing he would be returning to Fargus should take place in the middle of the month instead of the beginning. This would make it more clear to the player that enough time has passed for Dimitri to become a good person again. One of the biggest things missing from Three Houses is a good old-fashioned anime epilogue scene. It's pretty startling to go from killing the final boss, to a short cutscene, to a marriage proposal cutscene, to the credits. Technically, they have these cutscenes where Gerald talks to a mural, but I don't remember a single thing he's ever said during one of these, and I never will. <laughs> While every route could use an epilogue, this route in particular would have benefited from a brief one just to tie up a few loose ends. Talus is killed off in this route, but the Agarthans are still a big issue. While I think focusing on the Agarthans too much could be dangerous for the story, showing a cutscene of King Dimitri defending Fodlan from the mysterious force manipulating Edelgard would be a nice bonus. This epilogue could also include Gilbert making things right with his family, and Rhea could even be given something to do. Seriously, Rhea reveals she's a dragon and then never shows up again. W what the hell? If it wasn't obvious before, I really liked Azure Moon. I didn't make nearly as many changes as I had for other routes, and that's simply because it's already so good in its current state. Again, Silver Snow doesn't have a protagonist. The video's over now, uh, you can go, but there's gonna be a superfluous Rat King meme here for you. <laughs> oh, hey, buddy. Yeah, what's going on there, pal? Oh my god, I just found a rat's nest. Slaughtered about 200 of them. <laughs> 200? <laughs> Couldn't be. That's Christ. Uh, it's like... It's like whole generations of those things have died in my hands and mothers, fathers, grandfathers, little baby rats. <laughs> mm, yeah. Wow. Well... You know, keep up the good work. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, though, if our lives are really more valuable than theirs, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are. Yeah. Our, our lives are, definitely, yeah. yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. If that makes you feel any... Yeah, well, mm -hmm. suppose I ought to... Get back to it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Jump right back in there. <laughs>